Dead Rising 4 is, unfortunately, a mess. It not only is a boring, nearly forgettable game in its own right, it does not belong in this franchise. I feel like this dead horse has been beaten into a puddle already, but the game makes it incredibly hard to come away with a positive impression. I really wanted to have a differing opinion than most other people, shedding light on what was actually a decent game. When I was slogging my way through Dead Rising 3, something being worse than that was incomprehensible to me. I think there was a salvageable product somewhere in this completely surface level heap of mundane garbage, but it would require some big adjustments. There's a lot of bad in this game, but also some not so bad. I'll go through it all in this hour long, somewhat Christmas themed special. Watch the previous videos in the series if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel if you like long videos where I apparently complain about Capcom Vancouver for hours on end. The biggest problem the game has, one that I found it very difficult to look past, was the return of the supposed Frank West. I say supposed as besides having his memories and backstory, there's nothing about this man that is Frank West. Even though we saw a fantastic depiction of an older Frank in Off the Record, this guy is... Just, he, he doesn't, it doesn't look like him. This doesn't look like Frank. Apparently he was 52 here, or he was 41 and off the record. I almost want to say he looks younger in this game, but really it just doesn't resemble Frank. This is something that I could look past. If this was the only change, I wouldn't even be mentioning it. He also has a completely new voice. If it were just a riot, I doubt the military would quarantine the entire area. The moratorium on information getting out is a little extreme, in my opinion. So this guy, Brad Park, director of CDC, says there's an outbreak in Willamette, and little Vicky Chu is already there, getting the scoop. My scoop. Surely, I thought, this had to be some issue with Frank's original voice actor, but nope. Apparently this was a purposeful decision to hire a different person for the job. They wanted someone to play a more grizzled, older take on Frank, Hey Capcom, a 41 and 52 year old don't sound that different. It's even worse when you look at it this way. Dead Rising 4 takes place 16 years after the first game did, but of course the game itself came out only 10 years after. Are you getting my point here? Terence J. Rotallo, the voice actor for Frank in Dead Rising 1, was 40 years old at the time of release, voicing a 36 year old character. He would have been 50 years old at the time of release for Dead Rising 4, where he would have been voicing a 52-year-old character. The cherry on top is that the new voice actor they hired is 8 years younger than the previous voice actor. It's staggering how bad of a decision this was. I'm sorry to the voice actor who played Frank in this game, but it's just terrible. I have no doubt you could do good work if you had your own character to delve into, but this was so off-putting and frankly alien-like. This wasn't even close to Frank. It's not just the way he sounds either. None of his lines sound like something he would say. Constant, and I mean, constant jokes over and over. Barely any of them good. Yes, though I also answered a hey asshole or Frank who. Can we get a room? Separate beds though. Oh, you're hilarious. No, no, no updates. Holy fuck, the hell. You know, you should have been a tabloid journalist. Oh, screw you. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that your subject. Both your parents were killed by tabloid journalists. Ha uh ha. -huh. But not as crazy as the wingnut Tom picked, and he takes the cake. Ex-dairy farmer turned fascist. Yeah, we're BFS now. His engineer, Hammond, gave me a key to the dam. That's where Obscure lured this thing. She seems cool. We're BFFs now. All right. We need cover. That hotel looks good. Eh, three stars are best. You ever stop clowning? I don't Take think there's a around. single moment where he wasn't trying to be an asshole intentionally for a laugh, or just making some terrible attempt at humor. Things change. Change? Time to change the channel. This guy's gonna be begging for change. He keeps making movies this bad. <laughs> they should change this movie to something good. This movie stinks. We better change his diaper. <laughs> That's change we can believe in. Okay, obviously something strange is happening here. What do you mean? Making jokes during the movie. Yeah, but you're doing it with the speed and determination of the incomparable Robin Williams. Yeah. What's worse about this whole ordeal, Frank didn't even need to be in this game. They didn't need to tell a story about a returning Frank West. 
I don't accept the excuse that it was necessary for the story to work, as the story is just god-awful. It has far less of the execution problems that plagued Dead Rising 3, but instead it's just boring. I could fall asleep to it. It attempts to sell you on some thrilling investigation for the mysterious deadly monster worse than a zombie, which is just some zombie dude in a robot suit. The way it ties into the story of the first game was pointless, nearly verging on the lines of ruining a part of the first game's charm by attempting to explain some of the backstory of Dr. Barnaby. I'll get to the story bits later on, but my point is, using the excuse that the game requires Frank to be involved for story reasons isn't valid, since the story is unremarkable. If they didn't want to get the original voice actor, or at least write better lines for Frank, they shouldn't have even bothered. Make this dude some new hero, Bob. Bob could have been his own thing, but instead we get this replicant-like version of Frank, as if someone who is nothing like him in any way murdered the real version, stole his camera, and adopted his backstory. They try to build on his character in a somewhat interesting way with the PTSD angle, but it's thrown aside immediately after the intro cutscene, and instead is used as a mechanism for more joke-telling. My therapist says it's an ongoing process. He's also apparently very into mini-golf. I love mini-golf. And that's brought up quite a few times in his dialogue with Vic, and is its own DLC game mode. Nothing is serious to Frank except mini-golf, apparently. He tries to fist-bump people awkwardly. He's apparently a comedian in his first starring role for a feature film, as in every scene he's constantly on. On? How oh, well you work with others? Oh, well, shit, that's never been my strong suit. <laughs> Just kind of stuffy in here, don't you think? A little fresh air, you know. <laughs> I really thought that would work. <laughs> he goes out of his way to not help survivors when in cutscenes, even though that goes directly against how often you as a player help random survivors. There's so much I can't stand about Frank, and trust me, my hatred for him will prop up throughout this video. There is a very interesting theory about Dead Rising 4 and Frank not actually being himself, but an imposter Hank East. I'll link the Reddit thread that goes into it. I think this theory makes a lot of sense, and it makes the game a little bit better, but I really don't think Capcom Vancouver were actually going for this sort of thing, so I won't be discussing it in depth in this video. It is good though, probably a lot more thought out than the people in charge of Capcom Vancouver could come up with. Along with Frank, of course, comes his camera, I don't explicitly hate the way it works, at least I didn't initially. There are three filters to pick from, Normal, Night Vision, and Spectrum Analyzer. Night Vision is pretty cool, which comes in handy in deliberately dark rooms, and the Spectrum Analyzer is mostly used to find hidden things, like fingerprints to a safe, weak spots on a wall for certain story quests, and other such things like that. However, after a while, the camera becomes an enormous hassle, as it's required throughout many parts of the main quest. I don't mind the idea of needing to photograph evidence, but the way it's implemented is straight up annoying. You'll have a few vague hints that also serve as puns more often than not. Then you're off to walk around the room in camera mode to find that specific item. Your HUD will turn orange if you're close to a clue, but it almost never seems clear what it is I'm supposed to be looking at, or what angle or distance the game is asking for. There were so many times where I was definitely looking at the correct object, but Frank didn't like it, so I would back up, move forward, go side to side, zoom in, zoom out, and so on. Yeah, that angle of the broken door is much better, Frank, sure. Oh yeah, getting closer to this group of dead bodies is clearly a dumb idea, better go back and zoom in like the game wants me to. It's even more frustrating when you see Frank take pictures and cutscenes since he clearly doesn't have a good angle, but is fine with snapping photos indiscriminately. These clue segments occurred more and more frequently, it seemed, as I progressed in the story, and I was so tired of them by the end. Thankfully for the collectible side of things, the camera is a pretty good time. The night vision isn't used quite as often to find secret things as I'd like, and since literally no light from outside the room gets in, the rooms that require it are framed as walking into the abyss. 
but finding a zombie tag on a wall in a dark room was worth it. These zombie graffiti collectibles are a really nice addition, giving use to the camera even more. They don't really offer much besides some experience, but I had a good time finding them. The spectrum analyzer, aside from showing you which objects in the room you can interact with and open, can also open safes, which nets you some scrap and a gun usually. I have to mention that I think there was a missed opportunity here, or at the very least what is currently in game with these spectrum analyzer puzzles is pretty ridiculous. I totally get seeing the four keys that someone had been using most often when interacting with this keypad, but seeing Frank just enter in the correct number immediately doesn't make any sense. It would have been nice for them to work out a way to let the player use that as a part of the puzzle, and some other hint to tell them which order to press them in. This thing gets more ridiculous during a story sequence, where you use the analyzer on a keyboard. That's an awful lot of keys there, which already doesn't make any sense as a keyboard isn't only used for passwords, but to figure out which order to press them in first try, it's all so ludicrous. Why even bother? The last thing I'll say about the camera is how surprised I was to not see any tragic endings. I said that I liked the idea, but the lack of interactivity and the omniscient map being aware of their existence made them kind of lame. Taking pictures of especially gruesome death scenes would have been a perfect fit, but I'm assuming since they kind of had you do that with a few of the mandatory investigation segments with the military dead bodies being hung up and such, they didn't want to overdo it. I wish they had reversed their thinking on it. Less mandatory story dead bodies, more random, ridiculously gruesome dead bodies that aren't required to photograph as evidence. Since we're kind of on the topic of collectibles already, there's also blueprints to find all over like in the previous game, there's notebook entries that could be in the form of newspapers or cell phones, and my favorite, zombie safe house keys. The notebook entries are basically audio logs and other such lore, telling micro stories of people's day either before or on the outbreak, or further expanding on the town's history. My favorite one has to be the Terror is Romantic fanfiction that tells the story of Chuck and TK as romantic partners. It's pretty fucking amazing, all things considered. This is the kind of humor that is perfect for this series. I just love the absurdity of seeing this sitting right next to a much more serious personal story about surviving the zombie outbreak or something. Incredible. The zombie safe house keys are a great idea for plenty of reasons. First of all, they fit perfectly in this world. Since this was the first US city that the zombie outbreak happened, Creating panic rooms all over the town seems like a completely plausible precaution, even if there is a cure for the zombie virus in this world. Secondly, the keys you find aren't directly next to the safe room, you'll get a vague location marker on your map after you grab it. Thirdly, in addition to a survivor trapped inside, there's also healing items and plenty of good weapons, making this essentially a secret room worth going in. You gotta love secret rooms. Another thing you'll collect is the new currency, Scrap. And it's giant gold coins. This seems really lazy, to be honest. The zombie outbreak in this town has been going on for about six weeks, and that's apparently enough time for the people to completely lose all sense and trade scrap for valuable goods. I don't even know why it's called scrap, since it's clearly presented as money, but it's obviously not money, and it's found fucking everywhere. Opening any drawer, locker, bag, or what have you will net you some no matter what. This is just silly. Like, what is it? Money or not? I, I don't understand. I really don't see a reason why cash couldn't be used like in Dead Rising 2, or even more interestingly, they could have used food and blankets as a bartering tool, which is something that is mentioned in a few audio logs. With Frank, though, just fork over some scrap and get access to a whole host of food, weapons, and vehicles. You can even pay to get your map updated with the collectible locations of the area. Now, I did not like having every secret plastered all over the map in the previous game, and while I would never understand someone wanting to turn secret hunting into a chore, the fact that it's an option this time around is better. After I bought one of these on accident, I avoided them throughout my entire playthrough. The safe houses themselves that are all over the map aren't something I loved, but it is an improvement over Dead Rising 3, it feels much more like a hub area, especially since apparently it connects to the other areas of the map. This is where the stranded survivors run to, I think, which is good that they don't just disappear. Well, I mean, they, they still do. 
but at least they end up somewhere after they teleport. As far as the open world as a whole goes, I am both very impressed and also completely underwhelmed. On the one hand, the Megaplex itself is pretty fun to explore around in, and to an extent I felt the same way about the downtown area of the city. The interiors were surprisingly detailed, I kept thinking it would look worse eventually, but every time I walked inside a new store there were so many cool things to look at. The amount of interesting posters on the wall advertising some movies from this world was nice to see. I especially loved this historical building that delves into the history of the town itself and talks about the outbreak, Frank, and even shows a picture of Adam the Clown. There was writing on these plaques even. Great stuff. The comic book store had that t-shirt display you always see where it shows you the design, and since it's a Capcom game, it's all real Capcom characters and what have you. The same can be found with random posters in a few other places. The apartments and even makeshift camps look lived in, like there was care and forethought given to making it look like a real living space. The return of a varied color palette was also welcomed. Now, all that being said, the world is way too big. I think the Megaplex itself is pretty good, as is Old Town to an extent, but you also have the connecting roads to and from Westridge and North Peak, both of those areas itself, and whatever the fuck this area is on the map. The worst part about it is you spend most of the story in North Peak and West Ridge. Once I stepped foot outside the Megaplex mall thing, I unfortunately never stepped foot in it again until the last boss fight. I had to wander through single-family homes, empty barns, and construction areas. In addition to lots of snowy grasslands, instead of exploring the fun and vibrant Megaplex. Now, I don't think it even touches how incredible the original Willamette Mall was laid out, but it's not bad. It's certainly better than anything I saw in Dead Rising 3. I also liked how zombies didn't litter every inch of the building. There were some dense areas and some lighter ones. So one thing that was apparent to me right away was that pleasant music was brought back in certain locations. My favorite song from Dead Rising 2 was included. And yes, I do like that song, but Capcom has gotta stop doing this stuff. Bringing out the nostalgia act yet again is just getting annoying. I also question if they really would keep reusing the same songs from the original Willamette Mall, given they were the backbeat to many of the horrors that day. Just seems like such a weird thing to do in this fictional world. Through that lens, it's also been 16 years since those events. I'd have to think there would be some new music at this point, come on now. The music isn't all bad, though. The Christmas music you'll hear in the pause menus while driving certain vehicles and in certain locations in the city were pretty great. It really sets the mood and clashes perfectly with the horrors of a zombie outbreak. Instead of inspirational, supposedly generic music, we get jazzy versions of Christmas classics like Deck the Halls. Very nice. Calling this a Christmas game I think would be stretching it, but since there really aren't that many Christmas games out there, I guess we can count it. I did have a really fun time with the Christmas DLC that puts elf costumes on the zombies, and even better, gingerbread and snow people costumes on the more dangerous types of zombies. You can even recreate a scene from everyone's favorite DreamWorks movie with these guys. <laughs> I'm speaking of Shark Tale, of course. You'll also spot some survivors in these costumes, too. There's not many games where you can dress up as Santa Claus and beat up some elves, so it has that going for it. I almost wish they leaned a bit more into the Christmas theme, but then again, the final boss fight has you wielding Christmas presents and trees as weapons, uh, so maybe it's good enough. There's a Valentine's Day costume DLC as well, but it isn't quite as funny. If there is a category for Valentine's Day games, which there should be, I'm not going to count this one. In this big open world are a near endless amount of things to do, as Radiant quests have been brought back for more than just rescuing stranded survivors. Now you can beat up military guys, shoot down towers, and so on. 
it became apparent to me very quickly that these were generated on the fly, since I had done a task at this specific location outside of the park at least three different times. I really don't like this switch to repeatable but generic content. I think you know what I mean, if you've played this game or something like Fallout 4, finishing a Radiant quest never feels like you've actually done anything. More than any other, these types of quests take me out of the experience. I'm being shown that I'm playing a computer game, one that will regenerate objectives and enemies so I can play infinitely, but never really feel satisfied. It's the junk food of video game quests. I'd much rather have fewer but more thought out and handcrafted side quests, potentially attempting to say something about a character or give the player some unique challenge. At the very least fix or help a problem that feels somewhat significant, I may be dating myself here, but I remember back in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, you were part of a gang, and Turf Wars took place. Those kinda look like Radiant Quests in retrospect, but at least they affected the city. It's just colors on a map, but as a kid, those repeatable non-unique encounters felt like it had an impact on the world. Nothing that you do in Dead Rising 4 feels like it has any effect on anything else, and that's the inherent problem I have with Radiant Quests in general. I didn't like them in Fallout 4, and I don't like them in Dead Rising 4. Frank joins the long list of video game protagonists that murder hundreds of people without concern. Every successive game in this series seemed to add more and more regular humans as enemies, and now they've gone off the deep end. I'll discuss the gameplay elements a little later, but using guns is even more emphasized than in the previous game. This might just be my cynicism breaking through, but this seems like a decision made by corporate board members for the sole purpose of gaining a wider audience and selling units to people who might not be interested in a traditional Dead Rising game. Since shooting is such a big part of this game, you of course have to litter the map with more and more human enemies that can shoot back at you. Now, in addition to zombies, you have hostile survivors all over. Every fight with them is the most generic, boring, third-person shooter gameplay you could think up. I have this habit of yelling at stupid enemies in video games when they relentlessly throw themselves at someone who has already killed their entire squad, and this was no exception. Why on earth would these survivors, who take two hits to kill, who I've killed hundreds of, half a dozen right in front of them, keep charging at me? It's so frustrating. I can accept this from zombies or wild animals to an extent, but I have no idea why human enemies in video games do this sort of thing. I shoot their friends point blank in the face with a shotgun, and they keep coming at me. I want enemies to be smarter than this. The vast majority of humans you encounter in this game are enemies this time around, opposed to people you can rescue. It seems like such a far cry from the original game. The only human enemies back then were the psychopath boss fights and the military after day 3. The focus was on rescuing survivors. Now the focus is on shooting people in the face, obviously, so who cares about all that other stuff? It's even more jarring when you give the game the benefit of the doubt early on, buying into the idea that these survivors are worth saving and that they're unique. I remembered seeing this guy's face. I wasn't able to rescue him, but I made sure he didn't get killed. Well, all of the hostile survivors wear masks, but when you kill them, they pop off. When this guy's mask popped off to reveal the same face, I literally screamed! here. Uh, eat shit. Oh my! Is that the same guy? Uh, what? Is that him? I thought I killed a friendly, or I had been betrayed by the guy I just rescued, but no, it's just a reused model. You aren't supposed to care about the humans, just shoot the ones with masks on and don't think about it. Frank sure as fuck doesn't give a shit about the survivors, hostile or friendly. However, I have an example of a time where even the game doesn't care about the friendly survivors. Remember this guy? Luke? Well, I went back after I killed his look-alike. Now his name is Nathaniel. He's still here, a half hour later, holding his axe. But now he's Nathaniel. I don't have much to say about the survivors at all, but real quick, I have to show you how artificial they still are. See this guy? I saved him from the Radiant Quest cage, and he just stood there, even after I took out all of the enemies in the area. So I took it upon myself to help him in his time of need. I'll speed it up a bit, and here's where I left him. He just stands there as zombies attack him. Great stuff, Capcom Vancouver. Good job. 
Aside from those hostile masked look-alike enemies, there's military everywhere as well. They shoot at you, some have shields, and some have exosuits, a new addition to the game, where they can hold larger guns and axes. Not much to say, other than their extremely stupid name. They're called Obscurus. They are a private military who are trying to obscure highly sensitive research. Obscurus. Clever name there, huh? For the zombies, there are of course even more on screen at once, as if that's some sort of objectively positive improvement. It was much more fun weaving in and out of danger in the first game with less zombies on screen. You just can't do that with this many in one area. Even more frustrating, Frank now lacks the ability to wade through zombies with his arms. Now he will get overwhelmed and not be able to move at all. When jumping was the solution in previous games, now jumping will trigger an automatic kick and you won't move at all. I'm pretty over large zombie counts in video games and am glad this is the final game in this series. I will most likely be doing a series on Resident Evil in the near future, so I won't bring it up too much, but I vastly prefer how the earlier games in that series handle zombies over what the later Dead Rising games offer. Seeing a zombie makes you think about gameplay decisions, whereas in Dead Rising 4, they're just fodder for your guns. There were two new additions to the type of zombies, one that I kind of liked and one that I hated. The fresh zombie is basically a more manic and harder to kill zombie, as they've been recently infected. One of the reasons I like them so much is because if you enable the Christmas DLC skin, they all appear as gingerbread people. There's also a very interesting reason why they all look so similar, but I'll get to that in the story. It's interesting, but like most things in this game, it's a huge letdown. I really don't like their pounce attack, however. It's a jumping grab that knocks you down, slowly taking away your health while you tap the X button to free yourself. These happen far too often for their own good. Near the end of my time playing, my eyes would glaze over while I nonchalantly tapped the X button to free myself. The other new type is called the Evolved Zombie, and is the most annoying shit ever. They're green dudes who are exceptionally quick, jumping in and out of your view at a moment's notice. I don't know if Capcom Vancouver remembered what series they were creating these enemies for. They're far too fast for these games. They take forever to kill as well, so chasing them with a melee weapon isn't the best idea. Almost like the developers want to incentivize the use of guns. Crazy. This gun fetish has now bled into the game enough that there are now four separate inventories of items. Melee weapons, ranged weapons, throwable weapons, and healing items. Again, this is probably my cynicism talking, but this distinct separation of item inventory looks like an excuse for a player to pick up more guns, or the developers think players are too stupid to manage their inventory. This obsession with categorization is one of the game's biggest downfalls, as it takes so much fun of doing wacky shit with any item. Even in Dead Rising 3, I could throw a beer bottle at someone. It wouldn't do anything, but it was an item with no restrictions. Now beer is only meant for picking up and drinking. Remember in Dead Rising 2 when I mentioned I liked throwing the swordfish at zombies? Well, now the swordfish and other spear-like items are strictly for melee attacks. I can't aim my penguin spit shooter the way I want since it's somehow a melee weapon, so you just mash X and hope to hit your target. If the simple fun of it all doesn't convince you this is a stupid restriction, it also makes getting rid of items more annoying. Oftentimes I would just throw something I didn't want across the room in the previous games, but now you need to either hold down for a few seconds on the D-pad or go into the radial menu and press X to drop it. I really don't understand what is gained by having these four rigid types of item classifications. With every decision, less and less of what made the original Dead Rising great carries on. Throwing chairs across the room is fun, okay? Let me have fun, Capcom Vancouver, please! Speaking of that, honestly, they did improve on the combo system drastically in my eyes. Because you now don't need to pick up both items to create the combo weapon, I created so many more that I wouldn't have otherwise. Why not, after all? See an item on the ground, the prompt will pop up, and you make it right there. I love it. Frank knowing how to do this, since he's not a mechanic like Nick was, makes no sense, but whatever. I had a good time with them this game, for the most part. I like the elemental weapon types, ice, fire, acid, and electricity. Well, I liked their idea and their color palette anyway. They don't do much besides paint the zombies a certain color. 
I think all four should have had a very different effect on the zombies instead of a new flavor of destruction. Acid seems like a fairly straightforward one, but I don't remember it corroding zombies into a puddle. When you shoot with an acid gun, it makes a splash effect, then a sizzle noise. <sighs> Kinda underwhelming. My favorite weapon by far is the lobster gun. This is one of the most ridiculous concepts for a weapon. You just shoot a lobster out and they clamp onto zombies. What makes it better is that this isn't even a combo weapon you create. This is just something you can find out and about. There I was making my way through this crazy zombie world and right there on the ground was a fully loaded lobster gun. <laughs> it's downright absurd, which in this case is a good thing. For the vehicles, my favorite was the mini car you find at gas stations. <laughs> it's easy to see what I value in these types of games when it comes to gameplay, right? I love how ridiculous this looks. There's some pretty good combo vehicles you can play with, but my least favorite thing is how it controls. You have the X button, right bumper, and left bumper. All three do a specific type of attack. Generally, the X button doesn't do anything until you get your kill combo up. This is a game where holding the right trigger is how you go forward when driving, meaning that right bumper is a pain in the ass to press when you want to keep going while you attack. I actually resorted to using my right thumb to hit the bumper. Not good. The combo count stuff itself is something I really don't like. The best moves for most of the weapons and vehicles can only be triggered after you get a certain number of zombie kills in a given stretch of time. I think the explosive hammer and electric battle axe have such great combo attacks, but being locked behind that kill count is restrictive in a way that almost seems like I'm being treated like a toddler. I'm sure their heart was in the right place with this design, you don't want things to be too overpowered I guess, but needing to amass a kill count of 25 with the regular boring melee attacks in a crowd of zombies before taking advantage of a crowd clearing maneuver means you've just defeated the purpose of the attack itself as the horde is thinned out considerably. It looks more like a flourish at the end of a combo chain, which, yeah, I understand some people may like that, but I would much rather have weapons that have a clear and consistent moveset. If they're afraid of it being too overpowered with that attack always available, they could have made the weapon break faster. Imagine if the Tesla ball required you to swing at zombies 25 times before being able to throw it and cause chaos. That's what it feels like with this electric axe. Boringly slash zombies 20 or so times, and then you get to unleash the God of Thunder. In certain other areas of the game I haven't talked about yet, we see the developers weren't shy about including a cooldown timer for an attack instead of a combo count. That could have been easily implemented with these weapons instead. It just seems like Capcom Vancouver keeps making decisions that baby its players more and more, removing so much of what was unique about this franchise. It started in Dead Rising 3 with the useless, dare I say, fake time limit, the removal of messing up or missing a story deadline, the removal of the blunder juices that grant you fun buffs, the removal of the conscious decision to manage inventory properly in regards to the magazines, the removal of friendly fire on any NPC unless they were an explicit boss fight or enemy, the addition of every secret and collectible showing up on your map so you don't need to worry about pesky decisions on where to explore in the open world, and destination markers pointing you towards your goal with pinpoint accuracy. They've kept all of those things in Dead Rising 4, but now you can't even throw melee weapons at zombies, you can't drop your weapons at all unless you go through the extra step of loading into your radial menu or holding down for a couple of seconds. Your inventory as a whole has been separated into four slots, so you rarely have to worry about inventory management anyway, and now you can't use the move you created a combo weapon for half the time unless you build up your combo meter. Of course, you gotta include stealth mechanics as well, right? That's something that's required for a AAA third-person shooter, right? If you want a perfect example of how generically average this series has become, take a look at this moment in one of the early storyline missions. You meet Connor, he has guns for you. This is obviously meant to be a tutorial section for guns, even though you just used guns in a previous section with Brad, but ignore that. What follows is the classic third-person shooter trope. Brad needs to unlock this door, so you and Connor need to fend off waves and waves of enemies. These are of course hostile survivors, meaning it's a boring gunfight. They randomly spawn right outside even though they weren't there before and inexplicably are desperate to attack you. 
This alone would be enough. An open and shut case. This ridiculous waves of enemies bullshit while an NPC does a task has no place in Dead Rising full stop. It gets worse though. In an attempt to see what would happen if Brad died, I let this little scene play out without my involvement. I of course can't shoot Brad myself, he's a friendly NPC after all, so I went to the top of the balcony to let the bad guys do their dirty work. I sat here literally for 24 minutes. In those 24 minutes, Brad worked tirelessly on trying to get that door open to no avail. In those 24 minutes, these hostile survivors worked tirelessly to kill Brad to no avail, even though his health bar at the top was as low as it could go. In those 24 minutes, Connor worked tirelessly trying to kill these incoming enemies to no avail. In those 24 minutes, all of their guns worked tirelessly to assure more bullets were fired in this length of time than probably the entirety of my playthrough. In those 24 minutes, my PC worked tirelessly, making sure the game I was playing ran exactly how it was programmed to, unfortunately with great success. After it was clear Brad's health bar was a lie, this whole ordeal is fake, artificial, contrived, pandering, I finally went down to take them out. You know, it took me a few bullets and enemies died basically immediately. Then, of course, Brad gets the door open. Yay! Woohoo! Good job, Brad. This also highlights just how incongruent you are to this world. The enemies and NPCs reload their guns. They even shout out when they're reloading. When your gun runs out of ammo, you drop it. It effectively breaks. Now, I'm fine with that aspect, but because there are so many other humans who use guns, who of course need to have an infinite amount of ammo, they reload their guns instead of tossing them aside. Where is their ammo? Why can't Frank use their ammo? It just paints the player as such an odd figure in this world, one that doesn't abide by the rules the other characters do in the game. Do they heal wounds by drinking orange juice? They did in the previous games. I would probably think not this time around, as there are first aid kits all over, which you can also use as a healing item. It might seem more realistic to include real life first aid items when you have survivors being stranded in this town for six weeks and military personnel running about, but that kind of clashes with the ridiculous nature of how healing items were established in this franchise already. It's one or the other. You can't tell me a first aid kit heals Frank just as much as eating a cheeseburger or a hot dog. I guess I should mention the exosuit thing. Basically, it's a set of power armor that's on a timer. When that timer is up, the suit breaks. There are lots of weapons in the world that you can't grab normally, but with an exosuit you can add to your arsenal. I didn't hate this, but it just doesn't feel like I'm playing Dead Rising. The worst part is seeing a cool weapon and getting disappointed that you can't use it unless you get a mech suit. I don't really have much to say about it, honestly. It's surprisingly not as interesting as it could be. Can't make the movement system change too drastically. You may scare your players after all. Can't make the attacks or combos interesting or complex enough to feel rewarding, while also providing new enemies that will challenge a different aspect of a player's skill set. You may overwhelm your players after all. The few times they do build encounters around the exosuit, their boss fights, and they're pretty forgettable. The boss fights are something I've been dying to talk about. They are just terrible. I have no problem removing the label psychopaths from these encounters, but maniac doesn't really fit in my opinion. Lunatic, deranged ones, disturbing presence. <laughs> get it? You get it? It's, it? it's a Christmas pun. Do, do, do you get it? Do, do, do you get the, do you get the pun? Do you, get, you know, anything like that would at least point to their status as an unhinged hostile threat to the living. It's not like that actually matters though. There's plenty of other issues that plague these fights that are much more substantial. First of all, we don't get any introduction or death cutscenes for any of them. You just walk up and there they are. In my previous video, I did allude to the idea that Capcom Vancouver liked creating gruesome death cutscenes, but I guess I was wrong? Ho flippin' ho! It's much harder to let these fights stand out when you don't see their character on display. Secondly, some of them flat out go against what has, up to this point, been a fairly grounded series about zombies and government cover-ups. Basically all you had to do was suspend your disbelief on zombies being real, 
food healing mortal wounds, and chainsaws being the almighty weapon that can take down waves of military soldiers. If you got past all that, you're good. If the idea of a deranged Santa Claus or Pumpkin Man didn't catch you off guard, their superpowers might. Now, it seems that bosses can teleport around and spawn in enemies literally out of thin air. I don't understand why this was even necessary, to be honest. I sadly will not go through all of the boss fights this time around, as I didn't even get to all of them, but there are less of them overall and none of them are very good. I do like the heavy gimmick approach though, a mascot for a football team, an evil Santa Claus, I mean that stuff makes sense and is kind of funny. And then you have a Halloween themed guy and a reskin raincoat cultist fight. There's also a pirate guy I didn't see and a random acid maul wielding boss I think. And there's a knight with a flaming sword. Uh, that's basically it besides very boring storyline bosses. I will not discuss them more in depth in the story section. All of them fall into the last issue with these fights. Remember what I said in the previous video about extra enemies and boss fights? Actually, now is a good time to have a flashback sequence. Everyone say the magic words. Flashback, 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 ho! The only part I didn't like is the needless extra enemies that spawn in after a while. I hardly ever like bosses that include lesser enemies to fight, so the circumstances or mechanics need to work overtime for it to work, and they don't, so they just become an extra hassle. An extra hassle is putting it mildly for Dead Rising 4 boss fights. At least in the previous game, you could fight both the boss or the lesser enemies. If you wanted to keep attacking the boss and ignore the lesser enemies, that's fine. Well, Dead Rising 4 again takes choice away from you and shoves more simplified, run-of-the-mill, modern third-person shooter climax sequences at you. Damage the boss a specific amount, they run away and you need to defeat some goons. Now damage the boss again? Once a certain damage amount has been dealt, it's back to fighting lesser enemies. In the fight with James... Bob... In the fight with the Lieutenant, which is one of the two exosuit encounters, this exact thing plays out. Defeat regular enemies until they're all dead. Then we are graced by the present of the Lieutenant. Whittle his health down to exactly two thirds, then he fucks off. Fight regular enemies again. He graces us once more with his presence. Damage him to exactly one third his max health and fight off regular enemies until they're all dead yet a fucking again. If you're nearly out of healing items, don't worry about it. Enemies make sure to drop a first aid kit for you when you murder them. How very thoughtful. Now take out the remaining third of the boss's health. For completely average fucking human Tom, the game becomes so restrictive I was yelling at my computer screen. You can only damage him with guns since he just fucking stands above high cover. Watch what happens when I throw grenades and such at him. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Watch what happens when I definitely locate a wall that Frank could climb so I could smack him with my, uh, let me see, full inventory of melee weapons. Nothing. All you're allowed to do is shoot at him. Fine, fuck you too, Dead Rising 4. Of course, once you whittle his health bar down, more and more hostile survivors attack you inexplicably. Guys, I've killed dozens of you. Please stop running to your death. Fuck's sake. Then Tom runs away, you chase him to a different spot, rinse and repeat. He is the only boss fight with the death cutscene, I think. So there's that. Oh look, Frank is a dipshit and wants to fist bump for some reason. I will repeat, this is not Frank. The writers for this shit need to go back and play their own games? <laughs> the Scare King fight has literally both the lack of agency from the player on how to deal with hostile enemies in addition to a terrible Frank line. I brought a vehicle in here. I should be rewarded for my ingenuity, but instead, these hostile enemies can't be damaged with it. It's just dumb. Of course, this boss teleports all around because, you know, that's what pumpkin monsters do. I, I don't know. And finally, here's what happens after you defeat him. Listen closely. Uh-oh. Sorry about that. Not only is it clearly not in Frank's character to brush off human death so easily, 
I just can't stand this. I'm going to have a rant here. I firmly believe that video games don't cause violence. I'm not here to take the PTA's job and make such a terrible claim that video games are hurting our youth and all that shit. But come the fuck on, developers. Death is final. It's permanent. These are fucking people that are being murdered. I'm so tired of playing games where killing other humans is such a foregone conclusion, and once it's done, gets forgotten about moments later. Here he even jokes about it, like he bumped into someone at the grocery store, like he forgot to put cream in someone's coffee. Whoops, sorry about that. I'd go as far as to say that trivializing murder and death does more damage than glorifying it. This is far worse than Mortal Kombat fatalities in my opinion, at least through the lens of spectacle, the dying part is a pretty big fucking deal. This is a pretty good segue into the story section. I will not go through it all like I usually do. It's so boring, so uninteresting, so lackluster that for anyone who hasn't played it, I'm honestly sparing you from a nap. Just not along to my complaints without the full context, but with the satisfaction from knowing you didn't waste your time with this game. Fist bump. For everyone that has played it, you'll get it, right? Maybe not, it's so forgettable you may not remember what I'm talking about, but here I go anyway. The introduction nightmare sequence showing Frank's PTSD got me interested early on, but like I said, the PTSD characterization gets dropped fairly quickly, so all this does is waste your time when you start up a repeat playthrough. Most of the conversations in the car with Vic has a different light if you subscribe to the Hank East theory on the game which again I'll mention is pretty interesting. It relates to a lot of these intro cutscenes, and the story in general of course, but like I said, I'm not delving too heavily into that in this video. Vic calling Frank by his first name is a real missed opportunity. I don't see a teacher-student dynamic with them, whereas if she referred to him as Mr. West or Professor West when speaking to him, it would feel more natural. We're shown very often that Frank is so unfunny it's painful, so thanks for that. This little scene here seems to be a much less funny version of the same thing that happens with Ellie and Joel in The Last of Us. All right, well, I'm driving. What? No, this is my car. Why you try to get him right. I'm not even tired. It came out three years earlier, right around the time production for this game probably started, or at least was underway to an extent, so it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility that they just copied it. The whole point of this trip was to break a story open about some military base that Vic has heard about. This is the reason why Frank was dragged in, since he knows how to be a photojournalist. I'll be spending a disproportionate amount of time in this intro section because it has a lot of interesting ideas, and unfortunately, much of the main story and character motivations are tied directly to this event. When you infiltrate a secret military base, Frank falls down and has to confront his PTSD head-on by killing zombies. Of course, we get a throwaway line about his therapist. After you kill all of them, Frank says this was way more fun than mini golf. Vic points out how callous that is to say, as they were people once, and Frank brushes it off. This, again, got me very interested. Finally, I thought, we were going to delve into the ethics of killing zombies. These were people once. Yes! Here we go. You find evidence of a lot of experimental equipment, most likely used on zombies for some reason. We see proof that they're imprisoning zombies. Vic raises a fuss about it, saying she wants to stop them, and Frank assures her all they do is get the story and nothing more. Frank makes an extremely tasteless joke, which Vic calls him out for. Who wants barbecue? No? No one? Holy shit, Frank. This is some atrocity level shit going on here, and the best you can do is crack wise? That is unfair. I have photographed things and thought about things. Sorry to say it again, but... Jesus Christ, hashtag not my Frank. Here's the most interesting part. You come across three dead bodies with identical faces. You then find evidence that they have the same DNA. They're clones. How fucking rad is this, right? Not only is the game calling attention to the ethical issues of killing zombies that were human, now we have an extra layer of an entirely new set of ethical questions. Are clones as valid and deserve the same rights as non-cloned humans do? Where is this human that they've been cloning, and are they being held captive? 
And then we jump to the current situation of holy shit, they're literally cloning humans to turn into zombies to experiment on. We initially might jump to the conclusion that they're being created as an army or as some bioweapon, but it's even cooler than that. Much, much later on in the story, Fontana reveals to us that they weren't building an undead army, but a workforce, unskilled labor for coffee bean farming or picking fruit. Now that is an interesting fucking premise! So not only do we have the zombies were once human dilemma, not only does the moral question of clones and the rights they have get brought up subtly, but we have yet another question. Should zombies be exploited? Is it ethical to use them for slave labor? Sign me the fuck up. Let's delve into these topics. Oh, but wait. The game never brings up any of that again. Frank never talks about it, no other character mentions it besides Fontana before her boss fight, and that's it. Nothing is said about any of the issues that the game pretended to raise. Just look at all those cloned zombies running around, that's interesting! Fucking hell man, someone at Capcom Vancouver gifted you guys these genius ideas, but then you just take them as complete. Another element to a different story, not one to explore, but one to explain. This is how the zombies came back after the cure happened, and that's that. There's so many of them because they're clones, and that's that. This is why the military is here, and that's that. So short-sighted. So back to the Vic and Frank part, Vic overhears the imprisoned clone crying out. She rushes over, going against Frank's persistent badgering to not get emotionally involved, and they find where the clone is located. Frank treats the situation as a part of the scoop, but Vic opens the door and puts the clone out of its misery. Frank correctly is upset with Vic for giving away their presence, and Vic screams at Frank for viewing this whole thing as a story for a paycheck. How on earth can Vic not see that breaking this story without getting caught will do far more to help these people here than shooting literally one of them, hopefully escaping alive, and not getting the story out? Now listen, I totally understand Vic in this moment, getting caught up in it all, yelling at Frank. But this cutscene here shapes how Vic sees Frank forever. I think everything Vic says is valid. Frank is a dick. He's callous. He's not treating this as he should. But again, Vic's solution was a terrible one. She vilifies him to a severe and strange degree that sticks throughout the entire game. Later on, when we hear her audio logs, she's so obsessed with Frank, she constantly name drops him, refers to him as scum, someone who would never do what's right. I just don't buy it. It's been over three months at this point. Anyway, so when they run to escape the military base, she gets to the car and leaves without Frank. The story gets twisted, of course, to Frank assaulting unarmed guards at a reservist training center, and now Frank has to go into hiding. What follows is my favorite part of the entire game. I loved it so much, it's what I chose to use for the thumbnail for this video. When I was watching this stylized cartoony expository cutscene, I was certain I would love this game. Obviously I was very wrong, but this remains a great moment. This is the only one of its kind in the game, so while I am happy it exists, I am very confused by it. I would love to know what went into the thought process behind making this the one and only gorgeous cutscene. Finally, to complete the introduction, we have the cutscene of a ZDC agent going to the door of a Hank East. Two things about this scene. Why on earth would they name this guy Brad? There are so many names that exist in the world, and they chose one that had already been used for a high-ranking officer of some kind in the first game. I don't get it. Another is they clearly wanted a big dramatic pause between Frank's emotional lines and Brad's rebuttal, so they had to slow down this cutscene after the fact. You can see the frame rate dip for a bit, then return to normal. I'll show it to you twice. It's really clear when it shifts back to normal speed, it's very jarring. Alright, moving on, I'll have a lot less to say moving forward. Eventually you come across Darcy. He's important in showing just how much of an asshole this version of Frank West is later on. Vic is shown to be communicating with the military group much to Frank's dismay. You take down a quote-unquote boss fight. 
Oh boy, how did I forget to mention this guy in my boss fight discussion? Am I right? And he's dead. So Paula, Darcy's girlfriend, I think. I don't know if she thinks that though. Says this. You're going after them, right? You'll save Darcy? Uh, probably, but not on purpose. Before we do that, Frank gets captured by Tom and friends. He used to be a rancher, but now he takes the role as head honcho for a large group of survivors. He's obviously fucking nuts, but people go with him because he has supplies, I guess. His character is kind of boring. I don't have much to say about him. I only bring him up in case anyone thinks I forgot to mention him. After I showed up in my mini car, I met Hammond for the first time. You follow her for a while. <laughs> I'm honestly just stalling so you have more time to see the sheer hilarity of me driving through this area in my mini car. <laughs> Fucking amazing. So you have to fend off waves and waves of enemies. How very fun and creative there, Capcom Vancouver. So afterwards, we have one of the more egregious examples of Frank being a dick for no reason. After this, Hammond asks if you can give a ride to some of the survivors. Frank says no, that he's got things to do. Hey Capcom Vancouver, guess what friends? This clashes entirely with the idea of the main protagonist helping survivors and goes against the agency these games used to offer players. I WANTED to take these survivors back to Tom's. I was going to have to boringly drive through zombie infested roads anyway. Let me make use of that time. Nope, you gotta show off Frank being an asshole, since that's just such a funny character trait of his. <laughs> uh, and the Oscar goes too, am I right? <laughs> Afterwards, there's a quest where the game makes you throw a basketball into a hoop. I don't know why this was required. I sat here for two minutes trying to nail a three-point shot. Capcom Vancouver, what are you thinking? Okay, no, it's not actually a quest or anything. I just wanted to show you all that I nailed a three-point shot. Yes, I, I do think this is more worth your time than the details of the story. <laughs> that should say something. That's how boring it is. Not bad, but boring. Something honestly worse. So when you finally find and rescue Darcy, he's... Sorry. <clears throat> so when you finally find and quote-unquote rescue Darcy... He's tied up in a chair. Frank makes fun of him and refuses to untie him, saying he should regain his strength. Then, when the big monster shakes the entire dam, Darcy begs to be untied. Frank again doesn't untie him and makes a joke. I, again, as the player, have no control here. I desperately want to untie Darcy. Who the fuck wouldn't? But no, player decisions take a back seat to the feature film of Frank being an asshole for laughs. Woo! Fuck sake, Capcom Vancouver. My goodness. Just, oh my god. There's a small boring storyline mission where you talk to this convoy survivor for some reason. He says if you can get him morphine, he'll tell you what they were hauling. It's the usual fetch quest garbage that has no place in the main story missions, of course. But what's even more annoying is when you bring him back the morphine, he then tells you he can't say what he was hauling. He deserves to die for this transgression, of course, since this version of Frank West is a psychopath anyway, but obviously the game says no. You cannot touch him. He is more important than you. When you eventually meet the doctor of the military group, she brings up Dr. Barnaby and his old research. They draw attention to his cat. Oh, he loved that fucking cat. Now listen, and it's just, the will have what's the point? Before. We never heard about his cat in the first game. They just put a cat with him in the picture and Frank cares about it for some reason. When you get into his lab and find a picture of a cat in a safe, Frank laughs about how much Barnaby loved his cat. Mr. Flamel, what the fuck is this? Huh? <laughs> I guess Barnaby really did love his cat. Damn. I've played all four games in the series. I, I don't think I'm missing something, but it feels like I'm out of the loop. Like there's an inside joke I'm not getting. I wonder. F-L-A-M-E-L. Barnaby, you huge idiot. Is there? It's it's weird. Honestly, I, when I wrote this line, I was, I was like, I know for sure I'm not missing something, but it 
The more I think about it, there has to be something, right? Am I missing something? You can tell me in the comments. After the password thing and Frank taking horrible pictures, you have a mission where you need to fend off zombies for a certain amount of time. So many gameplay encounters are like this in the main story, it's nuts, my brain just goes on autopilot. It's kind of funny that the most humorous line I can remember in the game isn't from Frank, it's actually from Connor. We'll get slaughtered. Think positive, Connor. I'm positive we'll get slaughtered. So when you watch the surveillance tape of 15 years ago, you learn about Barnaby's research. Barnaby viewed the zombies as the key to immortality for the human race. He says he was recently contacted by an anonymous agent to come to the Willamette Mall. He says the voice sounded familiar, probably someone from Santa Cabeza, and he's assuming he will die in the mall. He knows how silly it is to leave his bunker, but he has a desire to see his handiwork in action. If he gets infected, he plans to use his big immuno machine to cure himself, I guess. Now, I hope I'm not alone in this, but I don't want backstories of characters from the first game. I don't think Capcom Vancouver should have even been given the right to use or mess with any of the characters from a game they didn't work on. A different team entirely created that game. This after-the-fact backstory and lore expansion is something I really detest in any piece of media. If the original creator had all of these ideas already, and chose to tell those ideas in a particular order, that's fine. That's awesome. You know, I, there are plenty of authors who do that. But this just sounds like what they did in the previous game with Carlito. It reeks of, actually. I don't want to paint a target on my back, but it reminds me an awful lot of J.J. Abrams. Actually, her parents did matter, as did Snoke, and now the Emperor is back. Capcom Vancouver, make your own stories and characters. Fuck's sake, don't retroactively modify and change our perspective on characters and events from the past. So it's revealed that the Calder monster is just some military guy who was in an exo suit that got infected with Barnaby's secret recipe, while also in the big zombie curing machine. Now he's a sentient zombie that we'll see later on. Afterwards, Fontana kicks Frank down the stairs. Frank, of course, says a funny line. Oh, man, that's a lot of steps. And then Fontana explains the exploitation zombie cheap labor thing. Which I'd like to mention again is so interesting, but the story kind of shifts into a different set of themes with Calder from now on. Don't worry, they managed to fuck that up too. So Calder has the hard drive that has all of Barnaby's research. When you chase him down, you get this cutscene. Calder can talk and is speaking to his evolved zombie posse. While on the surface it may seem like what Calder is speaking about has significance, it's a bunch of nonsense. He explains that the maggot became the vole, the vole became the rat, rat became the fox, fox became the wolf, uh, oh that's done. So this is obviously an evolutionary talking point, but he's upset that humans are still here, living, killing, and burning, destroying the earth, old age kills us, but technology is advancing to the point where immortality may be possible. I understand that Barnaby was researching immortality, and that's what is on the hard drive he is attempting to destroy, and I also understand that he himself is a zombie, the supposed answer to the immortality question. My problems are this. The human that was Calder just seemed like a regular military guy. We were never shown any deep hatred for humans destroying the earth or fighting old age from him. I don't know where this developed. He's also what he's upset about. He's immortal since he's a zombie. Yes, he's a creation of humans, but he also recognizes that all of them were humans as well. I just don't understand where all of this race superiority thing is coming from, or evolutionary elitism. Something like that. It just seems incongruent with the rest of the themes presented so far. It comes out of nowhere. I don't think it's necessarily bad. I'd be down for this Planet of the Apes-esque take on sentient zombies taking control, but it doesn't fit nicely with Frank joking around all the time, and being dumb as shit. This also is basically all we see of this idea, as you just grab the hard drive, run away from Calder, and then we run into Vic. She holds Frank up at gunpoint and demands he hands over his camera. He does. The case ends on that note. Then we have our very silly summary of the previous case, which is how it is when you complete any case, since of course you gotta recap players who may not have been paying attention. Then, the next case begins immediately with you chasing her down? Like, she just took the camera from you. They interrupt the pacing a little bit, like, oh man, this case is done, what's gonna happen now? And then you just start chasing her, like, 
The pacing issues for this game are just insane. I really don't like this chase sequence you have to do. The movement mechanics just weren't made for foot races, so it's pretty uninteresting. You have one big encounter with Calder, but before that he mentions again that Frank is a part of the human race who takes and gives nothing back. Not interesting. I think I may have been okay with this guy and his motivations if he was upset about his people, zombies of course, being planned to be used as slaves for human greed and consumption. It would have connected to the paper-thin themes presented so far, and would have made more sense as a motivation for the character of Calder. So you then have the second Exo suit boss fight, swinging Christmas trees and presents all around. Same shit as usual, you damage him a certain amount, then take out his zombies, then you damage him a certain amount, then you take out his zombies, then you damage him a certain amount, then you take out his zombies, then you damage him a certain amount, then you take on his zombies. When Frank and Vic talk afterwards, it just reeks of an average run-of-the-mill screenplay where two people overcome their differences, apologize, learn from their past mistakes. Ho <laughs> It doesn't land, it feels forced, I don't buy that these two characters care for each other at all. I don't buy that either of the two have learned anything from each other. I don't buy any of it. They bring up mini golf again and do the fist bump. It's just so dumb. This just, who who is this? This isn't Frank, this is Bob. This is Bob North right here. Hello, Bob North. So before escaping Willamette, you have one last finale event where endless amounts of zombies swarm you need to survive and defend Brad and Vic. So ungodly boring. There are three areas, and of course they all neatly display powerful weapons and healing items on the table for you to grab. Since believable level design takes a back seat when super duper exciting finale event gameplay is on screen. Whoa. Can you tell how done with the story mode I am? So the final cutscene shows Vic and Brad making it to the helicopter, Frank grabs the railing, tries to hang on, but zombies climb up each other to grab him and he falls. They then play music similar to Gandalf falling into the abyss in Lord of the Rings. It's pretty hilarious that they'd think we would care about this fake fucking Frank asshole of a character. Fuck him, glad he's dead. Vic then wraps up the big scoop, they get the story out, and yada yada. So before I get into the DLC of Frank Rising and Mini Golf, let's take a look at how this game could have been not terrible. First of all, we need to either completely remove Frank West as a character and replace him with someone else, or just get the real voice actor back with a less comedic emphasis. As I said, the Megaplex itself and Old Town were pretty good areas, so expand them by just a bit, as in bring in a few houses and stores and other areas and plop them in the streets of Old Town, and that's the entirety of the map. Bring the old inventory system back where you can throw melee weapons and food. I think if you just did those three things, I wouldn't have hated my time with this game so much. The map was just too big, so traveling between important bits was uneventful, and the Megaplex itself was barely touched on after the first case was done. The areas you're in for the most part are pretty lame in my opinion, so a stricter focus on the storefronts of Old Town and the mall would have been welcome. Frank is terrible, every minute he speaks he drags the experience down with him, so we need him gone entirely or the proper voice actor back. Finally, the experimentation with items and weapons and the map would be more enjoyable if it wasn't so rigid and strict. I can't believe I wasn't allowed to throw a spear through a zombie. It's unreal to think about. Now there are a few other things I would have liked to see changed. Boss fights could have had none of the waves of lesser enemies bullshit. Boss fights could have had the intro and death cutscenes again. The combo meter dictating the more interesting attacks could go away. Survivors could take damage. There could have been a better difference between the elemental weapons. And there could be less of a focus on the RPG elements. I know I didn't touch on it directly, but while I was editing I noticed I spent a staggering amount of time in the fucking upgrade screen. Even if you only spend 30 seconds deciding where to place each point, that's around 40 minutes of skill point placing if you make it to level 80. Fuck off with that waste of time! None of those changes I just mentioned would dramatically change my opinion of the game if Frank's voice actor remains, or if I would still need to spend most of my time in the most boring areas imaginable. It's pretty wild how far this series has come, isn't it? 
There have been so many changes for the worse throughout the series with only a select few for the better. I would add the combo weapons in the better category. The Zombrex was a genius decision in Dead Rising 2 but was done away with in future games. A lot of people had fun with the online co-op. Besides that, I can't think of any improvements to the series. The moment Capcom Vancouver were given the keys, we basically got an extremely big fluke of a game in Dead Rising 2 that was genuinely great, a surprisingly worthwhile director's cut, then a steady drift into modern AAA open world games formula. If there ever is a Dead Rising 5, don't be surprised when the returning Nick Ramos, played by a different voice actor, needs to climb towers for the many objective markers to show up on his map. Maybe food as healing items will be replaced entirely next time with first aid kits. If all of that wasn't bad enough, if you want to have the traditional overtime mode that every other game has had for free, you need to pony up some cash to buy the Frank Rising DLC. How very modern day, Capcom Vancouver. Very good. If you haven't yet and were thinking about it, do not buy it. It is not good. I know this isn't the most recent meme template these days, but this is basically what I kept thinking about when I played it. I plan on talking about the greatness that is Stubbs the Zombie at some point on my channel, but for now I'll just say it's what Frank Rising wishes it could be. It's an awesome game that you should play. You can actually bite humans to turn them into zombies to help further your zombie goals. You can even use your head as a bowling ball. It's so good. You should go play that. Don't play Frank Rising. It's bad. So Frank Rising continues literally moments after the main game ends with the sad Gandalf music and everything. Seconds later, we get to play as a zombie with the pounce, shout, and bile puking abilities. You fight off random hostile survivors. You can bite zombies or humans when you get a 10 hit combo to heal yourself. Eventually you get shot at by Hammond and are captured. Dr. Blackburn thinks they shouldn't kill Frank as he's most likely sentient and he proves it by grabbing a key and opening a door. We get shown that there's a countdown this time around. Once an hour and a half are up, the airstrike hits and you lose. Frank is still a comedic asshole even when zombified. And you then have to do a series of fetch quests to apparently save Frank from zombieism so they can all escape on a helicopter, I think. It's then revealed that zombies view Frank as a human and will attack him from then on. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nuts, you know. You're, you're a zombie and they, they attack you. Other zombies attack you. Fucking ridiculous. I am not going through this shithole piece by piece. But there are some fundamental problems with this mode, and some others that are just downright stupid as fuck. After you get your first power up back, a swarm of military soldiers come to attack you? Why the fuck would they do this? Why haven't they evacuated out of here? Their mission failed, Calder is gone, Fontana is dead, the city is going to be firebombed, why are they still here? Why are they attacking Frank? I really hate Frank's moveset. The bile attack doesn't do a lot, your shout ability is a quick stun, the pounce knocks enemies down, but you can't capitalize on it like attacking them on the ground. You need to wait for them to get back up. Unless they're so close to death anyway, then you can punch them while you're in the pounce to finish them off. It's so pointless. The pounce itself is controlled very poorly. You basically need to aim at the ground for it to work, as if you set your arc to fly into an enemy, it won't trigger. You have to aim the arc to land on the ground near them. This means when you need to use it in a pinch for shielded enemies or bigger guys with exosuits, you need to be constantly aiming at the floor. The worst of it all, by far, is how you heal. You need to get a hit combo in. 10, 25, 50, and 100 heal for set amounts. 10 being only for 50 health and 100 being for full health, I think. What this means is if you're in a combat encounter, with, oh, I don't know, five military goons shooting at you with assault rifles, you have no chance to heal, and if you do manage a 10-hit combo for an insta-kill heal, it gives you 50 health and that's it. This caused me to constantly run away, find a big group of zombies, mash the X button until I had a high combo, then get some health back. It's completely nonsensical, and given how you have no defensive stances or ways to mitigate damage from incoming gunfire, the later sections are just plain dumb. Even worse, that hit combo runs out, of course. It's on a timer, so even when you know you're on the last enemy and need health, 
you are forced, of course, to attack him to build up your combo, but then he dies at 9 hits so you can't heal. Then, of course, that 9 hit combo will run out since the enemies are all gone and there are no zombies around. Capcom Vancouver clearly didn't think this through. There's also the fact that Frank can grab things, can open doors like a person, he can talk, but he can't grab regular weapons anymore. Why the fuck not? Why would he instead use his shitty hand swipe attack as his main way of dealing damage? It's terrible, it's fucking awful, and it's downright insanity. This game mode is broken. There are of course some side missions you can complete which buff your powers, but even when I did a few of them, I didn't notice any differences at all besides when it would increase my health. They're also very difficult to accomplish, at least the killing survivors in the given time ones are, which means if you fuck up, you just wasted some time. Literally, as the countdown timer keeps going. It keeps going even if you die, too. It's just a bad game mode, all things considered. I wish I could tell you what happens at the end of it, but I ran into a roadblock. This winery mission, where you need to defeat large groups of soldiers, was impossible for me. On the first group, I had to keep running away to this little farm of zombies to regain my health, and on the second group, I stood no chance. Of course, when I loaded back in, I had to defeat that first group of soldiers all over again. I vowed to never play the game mode again. Until a few days later, I thought I can't let it end like this. So I booted it back up, tried to get a few upgrades to my abilities, but I ran into the issue of time, of course. So much of my time in this mode was spent farming zombies to regain my health that I was down to my last half hour. After completing two or so side missions, I figured 22 minutes was cutting it too close. So I went back to get those groups of soldiers once more. I got past the first group, but of course a large part of my health disappeared. What was 800 is now 530. Once I was able to farm one healing bite from these zombies, I went after the second group. Using all my tools, I took them down. Just barely, now sitting at 280 health with no options of healing in sight. Besides these farmable zombies once more. Slash, slash, combo 10, get some health back. Hoo, hoo. Now I'm at 530 again. Okay, last group, here we go. After many attempts and a drastically diminished time remaining, I finally got past them. Only to die to even more military goons. And instead of spawning me right there, I get loaded into the previous section again, where I would need to kill that third group again. After some last ditch efforts, I spent my last six minutes fucking around waiting for the firebombing to happen. You want to see something outrageous? So bad that I couldn't believe it? This is what we get for an epilogue. Hmm. So I guess Vic didn't get her story out with Frank's pictures after all, huh? Even though that's how the main story ended? But nah, because Frank as a zombie couldn't survive, all hope is lost. Of course. Before moving on, remember when I said they should have named this new Frank something else, like Bob? Imagine instead of the DLC name Frank Rising, they called it Bob Zombie. Oh man, what a missed opportunity. It writes itself, seriously. So because Frank apparently loves mini golf, they added a DLC for mini golf. I really enjoy golfing, both in real life and in a few games, hopefully one of which I will talk about at some point. So I don't hate this mode entirely. I think the charge-up mechanic that is used so often in golfing games doesn't fit with these wacky movable levels though. In golf with your friends, it's completely fine as you can choose exactly when you want to swing. In this mini golf, you might run into a lollipop windmill without much explanation of how you could have avoided it other than either luck or learning exactly how long it takes to charge up and swing, both of which are annoying. You can't go out of bounds on these courses, so there's rarely any interesting hidden ways to get to the hole. If you do try to skip a section, there's a big invisible wall that will stop you, which, you know, that's just a shame. There's also this general feeling of chunkiness. Maybe they were going for that since your golfer is wearing an exosuit, but moving around on the course and even going from hole to hole feels very stiff and inelegant. The worst part of this mode is Frank himself. He's the incompetent commentator that never shuts up when in chorus transitions. Even when you get a hole in one, he manages to ruin the mood. He has a co-host called Bob, which 
Hey now, I just mentioned the Bob thing. That should have been Frank, bruh. Yeah, overall, I didn't love Frank's mini golf, but it's there. It exists. I don't know why it does, but it does. One last cash grab before Capcom Vancouver was shut down. <laughs> no, I'm being cynical again. I don't actually think the Golf DLC was solely a cash grab, but it was a very odd decision. As much as I love to give them shit for a lot of their choices on these last two games, it is a shame Capcom Vancouver was shut down. I mean, it's a shame people lost their jobs anyway. I definitely feel for the people who worked hard and put passion into creating something for others to enjoy. I don't feel for the higher-ups who probably made a lot of these decisions that stagnated the series to the point where people choose to forget Dead Rising 4 even exists. I think if Devil May Cry can come back from DMC, Dead Rising has a chance. However, it may be less of a chance as obviously the director for the Devil May Cry series had a vested interest in a fifth game, while no one at Capcom seems to really care much about this series, as it was given to Blue Castle games the moment a sequel was on the table. We'll always have the first and second games to look back fondly on, I suppose. It's strangely fitting that the first game in this series is one of the most unforgettable gaming experiences I've ever had, while the last game... Whether willfully or not, most people forget exists at all. Thanks for watching everyone, it's been a fun series. I may be back to talk about Dead Rising in some capacity in the coming months, but that might not be for a little bit. I'm planning on a Resident Evil series sometime soon, but before that I have a lot of games I want to play and talk about. I hope you've enjoyed your stay in this crazy, long-winded look back at the Dead Rising series. If you like the channel, I hope you take the time to like the video, maybe share it around so other people can see it, subscribe if you haven't already, all things that will help this channel grow. You can also follow me on Twitter where you can see me complain in real time, or just post about random updates and whatnot. I may end up streaming on here sometime soon, so hopefully that's something that will interest a few of you. Thanks again for making it this far. Have a good one. I'll see you next time.